Our speaker tonight is Eamon O'Boyle. He's the director of Eamon O'Boyle & Associates. Um, Eamon's had a long engineering career. He's a fellow of the institution here. Uh, he has uh, worked for the Defence Forces. He's been an assistant chief fire officer with Dublin Fire Brigade. And now he works as a fire safety consultant, particularly in relation to construction and event management and all of that. So we're very happy to have Eamon give us a presentation on the fire safety legacy issues that are associated with Ireland's building boom. So we'll hand over for this evening for an hour and just reminds question and answers towards the end of the session, preferably. And we'll, we'll tell you the arrangements for that then. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eamon. This afternoon or this evening, I just wanted to talk uh, for a while about um, the legacy issues associated with the building boom. And this was something that I've been uh, interested in and following for some time, due, due mainly, I suppose, to some of the um, some projects that we've been uh, that we've been involved in. And I suppose in some respects, it was the, the tragedy and that that affected a lot of people. I don't mean in from the point of view of personal tragedy, but the, the actual cost that people had to put up with and the stress and that associated with. So it's something that kind of has uh, has stuck with me. Just in relation to what I'm hoping to talk about this evening, uh, I'll just give a quick recap, and I see a lot of people here from the fire service, so I apologise in advance. I'm going to be going over stuff that uh, that you do day in, day out in relation to the statutory framework. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of this whole issue, particularly in relation to the degree of and the level of media commentary that there has been uh, in the last while in this whole legacy issues. Uh, it is mainly centred around departments, but uh, there are other buildings and other categories of buildings as well, and I'll make some reference to that as well. Uh, I've just taken some examples in relation to the common faults and uh, some of the solutions in relation to uh, what we have found, um, and uh, I suspect it's what other uh, other fire consultants and uh, officers of the fire authority would have uh, would have seen as well, and uh, also maybe to focus on a remediation a remediation strategy. And finally, I'd like to conclude, and I, I suppose what I'm trying to do is extrapolate from the other points that we've made. Uh, with a view to um, uh, the, the, the coming up with kind of some solutions and perhaps suggesting a, a map forward or a way forward uh, to deal uh, to deal with that issue. So that's pretty much what uh, what I propose to uh, talk about this evening. Just a little bit about uh, Eamon O'Boyle and Associates. Uh, I'm the director on top. We have four senior uh, fire engineers who are uh, supported by uh, by fire consultants. Um, the main areas that we work in really are the making the preparation of applications for fire safety certificates, uh, disability access certificates, uh, fire risk assessments, uh, disability access audits, and also uh, discharging the role of uh, a signed certifier or ancillary certifier uh, for buildings, uh, particularly in respect of the building regulations parts B and M. Uh, additionally, uh, we deal with a lot of event uh, event consultancy, mainly dealing with sporting bodies such as the IRFU, uh, concert pro concert promoters, uh, and we do spend a lot of time making applications for uh, licenses for outdoor events, and also kind of dealing with the actual execution of the event management plans and that that are um, that are developed for. Uh, for, uh, for for events such as that, so that's pretty much our structure. We're based in uh, we're based in Ranelagh, which we can walk to from here. We got a taxi, but we can walk if we have to. Uh, just I suppose a recap on the statutory on the statutory framework in relation to um, in relation to kind of the building boom, and I suppose the backdrop uh, would have been the um, the legislation and that round it. And I suppose the the, the two main uh, the two main. The two, the two main pieces of legislation, I suppose, around uh, fire safety in the country would be the uh, the Fire Services Act uh, of 1981, which was amended in 2003, and also the Building Control Acts between uh, 1990 to 2014. Uh, the Fire Services Act, uh, I suppose, it was it was published first in November of 1981, which those of us who are old enough to remember will have been the uh, the uh, year of the Stardust Fire, which happened in February of that year. So it was legislation that was published very very quickly uh, when it was uh, enacted by November, uh, and that left a lot of um, a lot of gaps and holes and that that were exploited with uh, when there was various prosecutions and that taken. So it was amended largely in the uh, in a piece of legislation in 2003. 
the fire services act themselves set out really the responsibilities of uh, fire th- the, the responsibilities of fire authorities and it sets out where fire authorities and that are and the powers and that that they have uh, it also set out um, responsibilities on owners and occupiers uh, it also set out the powers and that of authorized officers of the fire authority and that dealt with things like um, powers of entry powers of inspection uh, powers of seeking information and that uh, and it also um, gave various powers of enforcement powers, and they were kind of, I suppose, reinforced in the 2003 Act, which brought in a lot of other other kind of, uh, I suppose, what what I would have viewed good pieces, particularly in relation to Section 18.6 of the Act, uh, that enabled fire authorities to require uh, people to undertake uh, fire risk assessments and uh, to get work done or to quantify work and then get it done and have a program on that, uh, which was a good which was a good thing in my view. Uh, I suppose responsibility for compliance with uh, with fire safety requirements is, I suppose, first and foremost, a matter for the owner of a building, uh, also the designers and also of the buildings. And it's important, I suppose, that each of these three, particularly in relation to dwellings and apartments, that each of these three uh, address the responsibilities uh, properly and carefully. Uh, and uh, you know, it's important that people understand where their where their responsibility lies and that and particularly uh, people who, who own who own properties and that have a particular responsibilities as indeed have the as indeed have the occupiers uh, the building control act uh, i suppose it, it came in in the uh, in the early 90s and that and it replaced which uh, a system which uh, existed in uh, mainly the major cities uh, at the time uh, of a building bylaw uh, building bylaw system and uh, the act itself really brought in building regulations for which really set out the building standards and the part b pieces in the second schedule uh, of the building regulations um, also the act enabled the bringing in of uh, building control regulations which really set out the administration for processing uh, fire safety certificates and also uh, disability access certificates and other legislation or other regulations which i'll which i'll talk about in a minute um, the Building Control Act, it, I suppose, made provisions for setting up building control authorities and that, and the aims that were associated with the um, with the, with the building regulation, particularly in relation to fire, was that uh, you know that they'd make the building safe uh, as part of you know safe for people who are in or around the building, and I suppose at the time it was kind of to be consistent with uh, the introduction at which kind of happened uh, around that time with the whole thing of making the health and safety legislation, which was intended for uh, safe places to work. And this, this was to kind of create safe safe places for uh, for people to reside in. And essentially, the building regulations, Part B of them, are set out in five separate parts, dealing with means of escape, uh, internal spread of fire, uh, internal fire spread of fire in relation to structure, uh, external fire spread and facilities of, uh, facilities in respect of uh, fire services and, and breaches of the act uh, you know carry fairly stiff penalties and more importantly I suppose from the point of view of reputation and that uh, they carry a lot of uh, uh, kind of bad bad reputation and that that people that can people can get so it's important that uh, that you know people realize that and that uh, the enforcement of these enactments, would have attracted a lot of negative negative publicity in the past, and I think probably a lot of it, some of it has been um, litigated in the highest courts of the land, uh, which is uh, which is unfortunate that that, that had to, uh, that that had to happen. Uh, in two thousand and fourteen, um, the building control regulations were amended, uh, which brought in what was called the, the building control amendment regulations, normally referred to uh, in the business as BCAR, uh, and the purpose really of that was to identify specific roles and responsibilities uh, up to that uh, fire safety certificates had been granted and uh, you know sometimes they were complied with sometimes they weren't this is this was a methodology of uh, identifying specific roles specific responsibility it also introduced the whole concept of statutory certification uh, it required the lodging of inspection plans with the building control authority and again, once the once the uh, building was completed, and that it required the uh, lodgement, or it requires the lodgement of compliance documents uh, with building control authorities. Uh, while I suppose it's kind of five, six years on at this stage in the thing, but I, my personal view and looking around is that uh, this system has has worked reasonably well. It 
probably still could be tweaked, but I think the the idea of it was good, and I think it, the way it's people are people are taking it uh, very seriously, particularly the assigned certifiers, uh, if for no other reason that uh, uttering false documents or documents that aren't uh, prepared properly um you know exposes people to criminal sanctions so it's a very it's something that will cause people to to think uh, i suppose the key features of the regulations is that they divided up the uh, the different responsibility of people such as the building owners uh, designers and builders and uh, the certification is required uh, in relation to the design and the construction of the building it requires the inspection of registered by registered professionals that's uh, chartered engineers registered architects or uh, registered surveyors and also all of this information is available on uh, on a public on a public register um i'm going to deal a good bit with apartments well not exclusively apartments tonight here uh, but Apartments require fire safety certificates uh, and this system will require that they comply with the design that's submitted to the Building Control Authority and uh, particularly compliance with, uh, with Part B of the building regulations. And I suppose that's the one thing that uh, that BCAR brought to the table, and that uh, there was there was there, there was a a trail in relation to uh, in relation to how that was uh, how that was done. I suppose one could surmise that uh, had this been the case uh, all along, uh, some of the high profile cases that I'll mention later uh, may not have uh, may not have happened. Just in respect of media commentary, and, and I suppose this evening I'm going to make a lot of reference to the media because uh, a, lo a lot of the, uh, the one of the things we don't have is kind of the idea of the you know what is the the um, the extent of, uh, of of the problems that existed post or uh, during the boom, but there has been a lot of media commentary now. Mainly, I would have to say in apartments. But it was interesting post Grenfell, uh, and it was something that kind of resonated with me. Um, uh, Theresa May, post Grenfell, uh, made a statement that she said it was of paramount importance that everybody is able to feel and be safe in their own homes. This was probably reinforced uh, afterwards by James uh, by James Brokenshire, who I think actually ended up as the Secretary of State in Northern Ireland. Um, but that they were going to put up uh, put up money effectively for the renovation of particularly. Um, Buildings where you had the alt the ACM or the uh, the uh, aluminium composite material in their uh, in the in the, in the cladding and that uh, for residential properties. Um, well, there was a lot of talk about it. I think in I think actually since then there's been little enough there's been little enough done about it. But that certainly was their uh, was their intention at the time. And I, I suppose that's one of the things that uh, struck me is that uh, how the British government were uh, willing to fund uh, a defect that had uh, that had occurred uh, within uh, within the buildings and yet we had kind of something that was appearing in the papers regularly and this wasn't uh, this wasn't happening just to give you some extent of the of the media of the media commentaries that uh, that existed these are just some of the articles that uh, that would have appeared in the papers in relation to boom time uh, in relation to boom times, you, you can see that probably a lot of them uh, you will deal with, and some of them not, aren't just apartments. There's also schools and uh, nursing homes and that that have been involved uh, with that as well. Just by way of um, a kind of a summary, uh, I suppose the most stark one of all is the uh, is the, is uh, the, an article written in the Irish Times. I think it was reported on by Neve Towie and uh, Jack Horgan Jones. Uh, which su which suggested that there were in excess of ninety thousand uh, apartments in the country of which uh, there were there were difficulties. Um, this was based on a survey that was undertaken by uh, Keenan Property Management, where they had uh, surveyed a number of apartments and they found that uh, up to seventy percent of them had uh, had problems. And if this, they reckoned that there was around one hundred thirty thousand apartments built, which meant that there are ninety thousand that. Uh, that are that there that there is a problem with, uh, and this obviously caused difficulties in relation to remediation, the costs, the dis the discommoding of people doing it, uh, and there is a kind of a, a fear out there with people of of this happening, and people just don't seem to want to know, and they're prepared to ignore it rather than address it, which probably is the worst of uh, the worst of all worlds. Uh, I suppose the one that has got most attention uh, was one of the articles, one of the many articles was in the Irish Independent where 250 people had to be moved out of the uh, out of the Priory Hall apartments 
40 millions worth of work uh, to get the remedial work to get it done. Um, and again, there was a lack of compliance with building regulations in relation to fire safety there. Uh, again, Longbow Key, one that achieved a lot of um, a lot of media attention, 299 apartments, 4 million euros worth of work. Uh, and some of the issues that were associated there dealt with compartmentation between uh, between the apartments, which was deemed inadequate. The fire alarm system, so both the active and the passive systems, uh, were in uh, causing causing problems there. Uh, other, other issues uh, in relation to the other kind of media reports uh, that was made before the, the Doyle Committee on Housing uh, by the chief executive of NAMA uh, of the properties that they took over of the of over 300 150 of 150 of them had trouble had various issues uh, associated with them and they had spent some 100 million uh, in remediating them uh, on properties that they had taken in, into control from debtors uh, Simon's Bridge in Sandyford again all of the uh, residents there had bills of between 11 to 14,000 9.8 million in, in uh, remediation and again a significant number of fire safety deficiencies relating to means of escape internal fire spread and again a lot of uh, failure of fire stopping material and I think kind of there's a consistent thread that seems to run through a lot of these that it's passive fire protection is where a lot of the issue arise and that of course makes it a lot more difficult uh, in dealing with uh, in retro retrofitting and that uh, with it. Um, other ones in Rathalton County Mead, 16 duplex apartments, 26 apartments, Meads County Council dealt with it in 2001, uh, again lack of fire stopping, 1.5 million worth of work, uh, Dundalk County Loud, 72 apartments in 9 blocks, uh, issues there dealing with, with cavity barriers not installed correctly, wall and floor, floor penetrations not fire stop, again 1.4 million. Uh, Clon Griffin in Dublin, eight hundred and twenty-six thousand euros worth of work. Uh, again, the apartment there didn't comply with the fire safety certificate that was granted. Again, the issues fire stopping many areas uh, within the cavities, uh, waste pipes and that uh, in and lift shafts. St James's Wood in Kilmainham, uh, three million euros worth of work there. Issues there included deficient. Uh, lighting alarm system walls that couldn't contain fire uh, for the required length of time. Uh, Beacon South Quarter, 800 apartments there, 10 million euros worth of a bill. Uh, Hollywell and Swords in Dublin, uh, 11 defects were found again between 15 to 20,000 uh, euros per for the repair of 44 apartments. And you can see it's the same thread kind of running through, and the actual cost per uh, per apartment is kind of somewhere between 10 and uh, 10 and 20 10 and 20,000 uh, euros. Uh, just I suppose there was other reports that were dealt with in relation to fire safety during this time uh, from in RTE News and I suppose this is, uh, there was the I suppose the fire authorities did attract some attention in that they said they weren't doing anything but the kind of the reality is they were actually doing something there were a lot of fire safety notices uh, served during this time mainly in Dublin I suppose that would be the case because it would be the biggest uh, the biggest fire authority in that but uh, 27 properties were served with fire safety notices in 216 uh, 14 fire safety notices in 11 11 properties in 218 county Louth had notices kilkenny had five fire safety notices west mead cork uh, mead had had fire safety notices mayo had them and uh, cavan had them as well so i suppose it isn't it it would be unfair to suggest that the that the fire authorities were doing nothing they were doing something from uh, in real, in respect of uh, in respect of the service of fire safety notices and that of buildings that presum presumably were deemed uh, potentially dangerous uh, at the time, uh, there was also the uh, the spectacle that came up, uh, which in relation to um, uh, defects in defects in schools uh, that happened uh, towards the end of I think it was about a year ago now, uh, or maybe maybe slightly more. Um, and there were a number of fire safety reports re uh, prepared on a number of newly constructed schools uh, where serious defects had been uh, noted. And um, particularly, there were it wasn't just fire safety was the issue here. There was a lot of um, issues found in relation to the structures and that of buildings, and there's been a lot of a lot of media comment on that. Uh, in excess of 40, 40 schools were inspected. Uh, there was 40 million spent on the, in relation to fire safety works. 
Uh, and in some cases, there was cases where schools were closed and that for a period of time. Uh, and that uh, Turlstown Educate Together School, for example, in St. Luke's National School, uh, where they shared a campus uh, where 1,200 uh, students uh, were 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 uh, were attending, uh, they had, they were closed as a as a safety as a safety precaution. Uh, so you can see that like that cost the state uh, in 40 million, and I, mean, I think that will be the subject of litigation yet uh, in relation to who's going to pay. But there's a lot of uh, it still costs uh, quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of money. Um, I suppose just in relation to the kind of research uh, we've done, I mean, 15 articles mentioned in this prepper in this. Uh, Presentation. I think they give kind of fairly clear uh, evidence because uh, <clears throat> all of these uh, articles, when they were written, none, none of them were refuted as being uh, as being untrue by uh, by the by the people that uh, about whose buildings they were uh, they were about. Um, and I suppose the evidence of uh, issues also associated with the buildings other than apartments in nursing homes, hospitals, industrial units, and uh, places of assembly. Um, so I think ar around uh, the 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 ninety odd thousand apartments affected, uh, which have been mentioned in this presentation, and that's on the basis of the surveys that was done by Pekin and Property Management. Uh, many of the high profile cases they have had fire safety certificates granted, but the design as described in the application that was never actually executed uh, on the ground or uh, was particularly in relation to the requirements of passive fire protection. Uh, there was a time, and uh, I can, I suppose, by way of anecdote, I was speaking with an architect a number of years ago who um, had a problem with a with a fire safety certificate where it had been granted and it wasn't executed the way it was granted, and he said he felt that it was only a box ticking exercise at that time. You know, so uh, uh, there was a time when fire safety certificates were viewed in some quarters as as an as, minis as an administrative requirement rather than it being. A, a very important, uh, a very important design uh, design document. I suppose the common faults and solutions that we would have found are in a number of six different areas: that of uh, lobbies, fire doors, fire stopping, dampers, cavity barriers, and uh, risers uh, would be the would be the main areas where we would have uh, we would have experienced uh, lobbies in relation to walls not being carried up to the underside of the floors above. Um, and this is kind of typical. You can see on the on the right hand side as you look at the plan view of a typical of a typical apartment, uh, and you can see the the kind of uh, view into it there. And the what's shown there in red doesn't uh, isn't completed. Again, you can see the red in the um, in 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 the plan view of the of, of the apartment itself. Uh, in relation to doors, doors lockable that require a key to be open, the direction of swing, uh, not closing tight, doors wedged or held open, intubescent or cold seals damaged or missing, excessive gaps, uh, hinge screws missing, locks missing, uh, gaps between the door and the frame and the structure not sealed correctly. I have a number of photographs that uh, just show you there the doors lockable uh, that require a key to open uh, rather than having a thumb turn. Uh, again, intumescent, cold seal, smoke, damaged, uh, as opposed to being uh, correctly fitted with an intumescent uh, smoke seal. Um, also, doors with the tags with the tags missing, as opposed to being uh, properly again with the various uh, markings and that that should be on them. Excessive gaps uh, again uh, with the, where the doors can be rehung and to give uh, proper proper uh, proper gaps and that within them. Uh, in relation to fire stopping, I suppose services and that aren't fire stopped properly or inappropriate use of particularly expanding foam uh, seems to be all over the poor workmanship, including the installation of fire bat, uh, fire bat and core visible or fire stopping uh, work not properly tagged. Uh, the most common faults, I suppose, that in a lot of the uh, buildings, the, the legacy buildings that we call them, that is the uh, is the lack of fire stopping for preventing the, the access of smoke from one apartment to the other. I suppose fire stopping is it's hidden in cavities and that, and really it can only be detected by uh, kind of professional inspection, and it's very difficult. It's a very difficult thing to do without causing a lot of disruption. Uh, and the retrofitting of fire stopping is something that is uh, is very difficult, is very difficult too, and really should only be taken, undertaken by uh, competent builders under uh, under professional supervision. 
Um, the in relation to fire stopping, I mean, these are some of the examples of uh, of, of of what we've seen. Uh, again, the absence of fire stopping to service penetrations, uh, as opposed to being done properly with proper uh, labelling and that uh, of the of, the, of, of with adequate fire stopping uh, to the service penetrations. Uh, other fire stopping again the expanding the expanding foam as opposed to the, using the mastic uh, around the uh, doors to fit uh, to fit them properly. Again, uh, the absence of adequate fire stopping at the top of the, uh, to the top of the wall as opposed to the top of the wall being sealed with the proper intubus and mastic. Uh, fire dampers are uh, other things with fire dampers uh, proud of the wall not within not within the wall itself. Uh, ductwork which is uh, un unprotected. Uh, fire dampers not again not installed at all uh, in that case as opposed to uh, drop rods supporting the supporting the dampers and uh, ductwork being properly supported um, is the other the other feature of that in relation to cavity barriers which uh, in a lot of the issues um, you can see uh, the diagram here which kind of shows the line uh, the line of the cavity barrier with the compartment floors and the compartment walls within the uh, Within the compartment, you can also see the vent there uh, in the uh, in the walls in the, on on the floors there. Uh, you can also see the cavity barriers around the windows and uh, the top of the the top of the wall. Uh, in respect of risers, um, again, ducts, access hatch, fire dampers uh, being properly installed, uh, fire wraps around soil vent pipes. Um, again, pipes, smaller pipes with mastic uh, fire stopping, um, cable trays, uh, and that with mastic or uh, pillows, and that uh, within them protect, uh, preventing the uh, uh, installing the the fire stopping or the uh, properly, and that. I suppose the, the the best I suppose source of knowledge in relation to that was is the uh, documents that are published by the association association for specialist fire protection. Uh, and they offer kind of the industry which serves with the knowledge and guidance in all aspects of built-in fire protection and they have a series of uh, quite a good series of books uh, which are which are shown there uh, that you can uh, that you can use for them and they're a pretty uh, pretty good series of books uh, which uh, should be referred to uh, in relation to in relation to this uh, in relation to the remediation strategy I suppose it's interesting to kind of look at what has been uh, what has been done by the uh, by the state or by uh, the, the statutory bodies to date, um, the, there's essentially been three different uh, three different approaches. One uh, a framework for enhancing fire safety, uh, which was prepared by ourselves, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the background of that in a second. Uh, secondly, there was a working group set up, uh, which uh, by the depart by the minister, uh, which happened post Grenfell. Uh, there was also a publish a, a report published by the. Um, by the uh, committee of the the oil committee, uh, I think it's actually yet yeah, the house of the Oireachtas committee on uh, how on on housing, uh, which was called Safe as Houses. Uh, just in relation to the first one there, which was one that we were involved with our, ourselves, uh, and we had we were at the time we had instructions from uh, Kildare County Council uh, in conjunction with the Department of the Environment uh, to examine uh, a fire that had occurred in Newbridge. Uh, where a number of houses had burnt very, very quickly. Uh, I think in about 20 minutes it had gone from one side to the other uh, in, in, in a series of six houses. And there was, a, there was a suspicion that all of the other similar houses within the, uh, within the area were, were, were constructed similarly. Uh, I think in the case of the fire, the fire was of such ferocity that I don't think anything, anything would have held it back. But there was a lot of uh, concern at the time that there was... Uh, properties that were out there that didn't have uh, proper fire uh, proper fire protection or of which there was a, a suspicion uh, was the idea of the document was that it would give people advice uh, kind of lay advice in relation to what to do uh, if you're confronted with that but also set out kind of parameters and methodology for professionals when they're making assessments of uh, of houses and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute um the scope of the guidance really was intended for occupants and owners of dwellings, houses and apartments uh, of what to do where if, if, if efficiency or deficiencies had been identified and or there were a cause of concern. 
And uh, I suppose the framework of the guidance was kind of two parts, really. It dealt with houses, uh, which, which dealt with single occupancy and uh, also apartments. One of the difficulties that I suppose we ran into uh, in this is that there was a lot of um, talk about why, why the fire authority hadn't dealt with, uh, with the houses. But however, the, like, the requirements of the, of the Fire Services Act are pretty, are pretty, uh, are pretty clear in relation to housing and, uh, and, the fire, and the role and that of the fire authority. Uh, it kind of sets out a priority of action to reduce the level of risk associated with the deficiencies uh, and it also kind of focuses in on the idea of conducting risk assessments uh, and this was I suppose to enable professional advisors to provide specific advice and more particularly to kind of uh, to give people advice in relation to the sequencing of actions and that that they would uh, that they would have to uh, that they would have to, to take to get their uh, their houses or uh, buildings up to a uh, up to, up to an acceptable standard um, and I suppose the whole kind of uh, thrust behind much of this was uh, while the fire safety deficiencies they're important and serious uh, there needs to be a kind of a methodical approach and methodology for dealing with uh, establishing what uh, what the extent of it is uh, I suppose what has been done, the other thing, the working group, uh, which really was set up post Grenfell, Grenfell uh, to look at uh, by the Department of Housing and Planning, and they published a report uh, in relation to that. And they had some interesting suggestions at the time, particularly in relation to uh, regulations that they would propose to make under Section 37 of the Fire Services Act, uh, which to date, I think there's only been one set of regulations made under that act, which are the ease of escape regulations, as far as I know, Dan, am I right? I think I am. Operational command. Operational command, yeah, and and the thing, but they've, it it isn't something that uh, was done a great deal. The the general trust uh, in the fire services act was to was to publish guidance documents rather than to uh, rather than to make regulations. Uh, I'm not sure where this where this will go, but it's certainly a report that uh, and there was a lot of work uh, done with it. I think there was a, big, a lot of contributions made by. Uh, fire authorities and the department, and uh, I was a member of that group myself, uh, as well as a number of other people from the uh, from the from the private sector. Uh, the safest houses was a report uh, prepared on building standards uh, for, I suppose, consumer protection uh, more than anything else. Uh, I made a submission to this uh, to, the, to this particular group, as did a number of others. Um, I'm not sure if I'd be. Uh, uh, that uh, that I would have agreed with the conclusions that they that they came to, uh, they were suggesting this, the establishment of a national body similar to the Food Safety Authority in relation to um, in relation to uh, supervising construction and that. I mean, I think I think the the system we have is is actually quite good, uh, and you know, there's a lot of expert there's a lot of expertise there which has which has embedded local knowledge, which I think would be lost if they were to make a national body uh, in charge of in charge of doing that. Um, just in relation to kind of all of this problems that we had uh, in 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 regard to the the, the latent or the uh, the defects issues that we have in in all of these buildings, uh, I looked at the uh, whole idea of pyrite, and while it's not directly related to um. Uh, to, to the fire safety deficiencies, it is quite instructive in relation to how the state dealt with it. Um, and they set up a, a system, uh, the uh, Pyrite Resolution Act in 2013, to remediate buildings where uh, where pyrite had been uh, had caused significant uh, damage. And they had a kind of a layered approach to it in relation to the level of damage. But the, the, and they had a number of stages there where there was applications and validation, the assessment and verification, the plan. Uh, tendering and tendering analysis for getting the work done that was contracted, the dwelling was vacated for the remediation works and uh, then the dwelling was reoccupied and the, applic the application was closure. So you can see there, there was the, a lot of thought had gone into it and it was uh, set out in a kind of a sequential uh, order as to how it was to be, uh, how it was to be done. I suppose it was something like that uh, that I was thinking in relation to kind of the remediation of the fire safety uh, issues that have been identified and the pyrite scheme related to uh, houses, apartments, duplexes, masonettes, uh, and I suppose it, the scheme applies to common areas in relation to residential properties like apartments and that. Uh, to be included in the scheme, the become must have been damaged rating, been, the, the damage must have been attributed to uh, pyretic heat. Uh, 
and it has to be identified in the damage verification process and that. Um, there's a, a number of people that I know who are working in particularly North County Dublin who uh, who deal who deal a lot with that and they would have they would speak that it's a system that uh, that has worked very well and has worked very well in in the context of it of it solving uh, at solving a problem and so the only reason I would bring it up here is that it is there is a uh, you know something that has uh, been developed within the state um to deal with a building with build, with a building defect uh, and maybe there are read acrosses that could happen uh, in relation to uh, in relation to that uh, just in relation to kind of uh, conclusions and that, um, in respect of uh, in respect of that, and I suppose before I before I do that, I just I suppose uh, I'd have to say that like this is a serious issue, and it's an important issue, and it's not not an issue about which we can do nothing and ignore it uh, that it will go away. So I, I, that would be my my personal view on it, and I suppose. The conclusion really is that there are significant fire safety legacy issues, and I think the evidence of that uh, is clear from the the level of me the level of media coverage, which wasn't refuted uh, at any stage. Uh, one of the things we suffer from is is an absence of reliable data to the extent of the problem, uh, which is a key issue that has to be faced. And in fact, during the the deliberations uh, of the uh, that we had within the Department of the Environment. <laughs> Uh, during the preparation of the of the Grenfell or the post Grenfell report, one one of the things that we kind of uh, came to the conclusion that even if you put all of the the expertise that's available in the country uh, and both in the public and the private sector together to try and deal with ninety thousand apartments, I mean, and uh, you know, one person could deal with you know literally tens in the year rather than hundreds. You can see how long the whole thing will take to try and get to the uh, to try and get to the end of it and. Unfortunately, that's not a reason. Uh, that's not a reason not to do with it. And one of the things we really need is some sort of reliable, uh, reliable data. Um, and I think it would be possible to deal with this in a kind of a proportionate way, setting up if there was a national program of fire risk assessment set up, and again, probably using the powers under Section 18.6 of the Fire Services Act, with uh, priority given to uh, obviously the sleeping risks uh, where people sleep overnight, and this would include uh, hotels, hospitals, any dormitory, student accommodation, apartments, uh, and the like, could be assessed on a risk basis, and that there would be a, a national. Um, a national kind of uh, norm set out and particularly uh, in relation to what uh, we're not going to get if we have buildings where we have difficulties and uh, we're not going to get them to kind of technical guidance document B compliance so there's going to have to be some uh, some leeway in uh, in relation to that uh, I think this approach of having a kind of a, a structured fire risk assessment uh, methodology is something that will take time uh, but we know there are deficiencies there, and it's essential really that we identify them and uh, have a planned action. I think it would have to be also included within that is uh, some sort of a government-backed financial scheme. And uh, I suppose I prepared this a number of months ago, long before the election was called, so maybe it could be uh, uh, dealt with in that. But you know whether there, whether there is some way that could be that could be dealt with by the government to fund. Uh, loans to, uh, where they could be dispersed through banks or credit unions or grants to be given to homeowners or uh, loans to be given to homeowners and a lien taken on the property where it could be um, where it could be uh, uh, recouped at some stage later if the property was sold or that it would remain uh, there. Uh, I suppose the, the, the situation in relation to building booms and the uh, Fire safety defects. It's it's a serious it's a serious and important issue. Uh, my own view is that there, we need to have a structural, methodical approach uh, to dealing with it. I think fire risk assessments uh, done in a structured way may be the way may be the way forward. Uh, and at least at that stage, remediation programs can be programmed literally and uh, done in uh, done in this in in a sequential way dealing with the most important things. Uh, dealing with the most important things first. Uh, I do think that that would need to be proportionate in the way it's dealt with, that uh, particularly, you know, the, the reality of retrofitting things like uh, cavity barriers and things like that is difficult. Uh, there, are, there are ways um, of doing it, but I just think that, that there would have to be uh, some sort of leeway uh, in relation to how that would be, uh, how that would be done. Um, Thank you very much for your attention. That's my my view on it. Uh, 
I'm, I suppose, banging the drum in relation to uh, in relation to uh, in relation to risk assessments. And sorry, just before I finish, could I just say thanks to Marzier who worked with me a lot for doing that. You probably guessed I didn't do some of those drawings, you know, uh, in the uh, in the thing. Uh, but uh, thanks again for that. Hi, uh, Keith Elliott, uh, retired but formerly of PM Group. Um, thanks very much, Eamon, for an extremely well uh, summarised presentation. Um, I think it's not overstating the case to say that you are probably one of the um, uh, the most recognisable faces of the, the fire engineering community, um, a person with considerable uh, authority when it comes to opinions on fire safety and so on. And my question is, uh, two questions actually. The first one is, is anybody listening to you um, at a senior level within government, which is where initiatives need to come from on this? And the second one um, is uh, speaking as somebody who's trying to buy an apartment at the moment um, and seeing that you know there are extensive issues here and there. Um, is there any central register or um, source of information where one could find if there are known issues with a particular block. Because I've had a situation where um, two estate agents offering apartments for sale in one block, one of them told me about significant problems with fire safety in the block, and the other guy claimed to know nothing about it whatsoever. So I'm just interested to know if known issues are documented somewhere. Um, I, I, I suppose the situation since 2014, that's where the watershed, I suppose, is. And post 2014, there is uh, probably good data it, it, because of the whole BCAR system where, doc, you know, where inspection plans are lodged and there are, um, uh, you know, inspections, there's records of it. And eventually there's a, there's a, there's a sign off by the assigned certifier coupled with documentation as built drawings and that, that are lodged with it. So I suppose from that point of view, there is a repository of information, but that only applies from 2014 on. Uh, pre-2014, uh, that is an issue uh, in relation to uh, how that, and I mean, I think there's been um, a lot of documented proof or uh, you know within the media and a lot of us have experienced it where people where apartments were constructed without with very with some of the faults that i mentioned there and even maybe more than that and um the answer is probably not there there, there isn't i mean if we'll say a, a a building had come to the attention of the of the fire of the fire authority there may have been a fire safety notice served at which stage there's a there's a register maintained of uh, there's a register maintained of those in relation to the other issue then you is is anybody listening um i think probably the like i think i showed there that the, and that was from a, a report <coughs> that was prepared by rte i mean there are a lot there is a lot of activity you know, in relation to the service of fire safety notices and that. And, you know, I don't, I think based on my own experience, serving fire safety notices isn't something that the fire authority does lightly because it has a lot of very um, uh, kind of very big ramifications for the building owners and that. Um, so it's not, it's not something that's done lightly. And I suppose what I'm trying to, I suppose, suggest is that there's a kind of a level below that uh, that is dealt with where, you know, the, that, people do undertake their own fire risk assessments and they schedule the works and that which you know will be will go some way to kind of satisfying the fire authorities requirements that you know of ensuring buildings are in compliance and that in regard to is is anybody listening i think that you know i mean i think to be fair to the department and the environment have you know they have prepared you know they, they did have the post grenfell working group and that uh, in relation to that so i, I, I do think it, it it does have a, a certain level of of traction within uh, within government and that uh, is it enough maybe not thank you for that very interesting talk my name is dara rogan just a chartered engineer um i've seen in other jurisdictions in europe where when someone sells a property you have to attest that it meets the building regulations mm. in place at time of sale mm. Is there any merit to a, a situation like that? I mean, we have building energy rating certificates at the moment. Mm. Have, has that been considered? 
Yeah, a, a version of that was considered in the uh, in the working group that was set up uh, by the minister yeah. uh, in relation to that, and uh, there was a lot of kind of uh, what we looked at at the time, and that was the point I was making there in relation to regulations being made under Section Thirty Seven of the Act, uh, was that there would be kind of a uh, how would I describe this a kind of a a, a plaque. Uh, in the wall with a kind of probably a QR code or something like yeah. that that you could uh, and using kind of you know there is a kind of a a platform there already with the BCMS system for BCAR yeah. that uh, you would be able to get the details of that building there to be uh, available that was certainly something that was uh, that was discussed at the time uh, in relation to my own view I think that would be the uh, that would be the way to go uh, you know for that which would mimic uh, what you were saying there in, in, in relation to uh, in relation to other other countries and that. And just one small question: Have you obviously there's a feedback loop here? It's going mm. to take 10, 20 years. Have you seen any design methodologies for how we construct apartments changing in order to make it easier to achieve fire safety? Has well, that feedback occurred yet? <laughs> I, I suppose in all construction, like there's three, com like you've you've the you've three components, like you've design, you've materials, and you've workmanship, yeah. uh, and um, kind of design is the design that that doesn't really change. Materials are the materials; they're the ones that are on the market. Uh, the weak point, probably in the in the whole thing, is the uh, is the workmanship. Uh, I think probably there's some move, and there's certain certain recent experiences that we've had. Uh, there are some move away from um, you, you know where where there's offsite kind of uh, fabrication of the various components of construction and they're brought to they're brought to site and you know where they've been constructed in call it laboratory conditions uh, you know and that the, the I think that will <laughs> overcome the third leg of that of the stool of design materials and workmanship uh, and that and you know where there'll be a lot more uh, a lot better quality control and that uh, of it I, you know and I think. I think to be fair, uh, the, the the boom issues that were there. I don't think anybody kind of set out with the intention of not doing it right. I think uh, the construction industry is one that's done very tight margins, and uh, I think that that probably was the uh, was the dry end. You know, the like to say in construct, you know, the construction you have good, fast, and cheap, but you can only have two of them. You can't have all three. Good evening, uh, Eamon. Thank you very much for the presentation. David Rouse of the Housing Agency. Mm -hmm. A considerable um, problem in this particular area is that the owners of um, apartment blocks, uh, and in particular the owners of the common areas of apartment blocks, are owners management companies, mm -hmm. which are uh, not-for-profit, um, uh, I suppose hybrid entities. They're, they're uh, residence associations mm -hmm. in corporate form, mm -hmm. managed by um, volunteer directors who appoint obviously professionals like yourself and quantity surveyors and mm. solicitors and so on and uh, a grave grave difficulty with the directors of those owners management companies is that that, that they're uh, effectively lay people they're not professionals they're not property professionals they're not uh, qs's they're not lawyers and so on and they're charged with the stewardship of the of the owners management companies and and their and their affairs so in respect of um, support of those volunteer directors, the housing agency has a program of uh, information events, and forgive the shameless plug, uh, a series of information events over the next three or four months all around the country, um, and they're on uh, Wednesday evenings between now and the end of uh, March, where volunteer directors of owners management companies can come along and they'll hear a presentation around I suppose effectively signposts as to where they go for resources and uh, information and equally then they can uh, have a Q&A forum after that it's clearly um, not addressing the fire safety defects but one of the recommendations of the fire safety task force report was uh, more robust finances and sustainable uh, finances within owners management companies so the, the agency is taking initial steps to uh, to reach out and and provide some uh, some uh, I suppose uh, signposts for the the cohort of volunteer directors of, of whom there must be you know, 20, 20 odd thousand around the country. So uh, that's just by way of information. And again, forgive the, the shamelessness of the plug. Thank you. I think I think there's also another group, the Apartment Owners Network, who are doing a lot of good work as well in that uh, in that regard. Right, Kev Kevin Woods, Aon. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, an observation and a question. 
um, the observation is I can think of a 1980s and early 1980s apartment building, so pre this era, mm. that had what I would regard as serious issues for, say, lack of an airing cupboard as a, a service duct, which I think probably went right up into the roof space. Mm. Um, so it's not, it's not a, it's, it's not a, it's not a, I recently received this well. The question it, it, it relates to ACM. Mm. Do you see or have you come across many buildings using ACM in the Republic of Ireland? Actually, as part of the um, the exercise associated with the the uh, working group, uh, there was a kind of I think the fire authorities were put under considerable pressure by the uh, by the department to kind of assess the buildings within their areas uh, that were the eighty meters and over. And actually, there weren't there weren't that many uh, in the country. Specifically, but specifically ACMs, would you have come across them? I've only come across them on office and industrial buildings. I don't think I've ever come across them on a residential. Yeah, I've come across one in residential. That was immediate. Thank you very much for your lecture, Declan Gibbons, Gibbons and Associates. Just Richard Manton, Manton in here is looking for submissions from uh, all sectors in relation to putting in something to for the election to from Engineers Ireland. So they prepared a document. Hmm. Would you suggest anything that engineers should be looking for in the uh, upcoming elections? Other well, than I, a remediation I, scheme? I, what I, I think to remedi and, and, and like I say, I, I was asked, Paul asked me a long, long time ago about this, to, long before the, was in, uh, before the election was in the offing. You know, and I, 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 I suppose at one level I kind of said that like this is probably something that should be very much parallel to a political process. This is about safety, uh, you know, and it's about kind of you know safety in people's houses. I think if it got embroiled into uh, into a political system, I think that might be unfortunate because then it would only remain current for the length of time it's current, which is probably when it was the 8th of February, after the 8th of February, it mightn't have the same level of currency. Uh, you know, I think this probably will have currency on the 8th of February 2030 in the same, you know, I mean, to get, and I, I, you know, I, I think that the, the whole, if, if I could get no other message across here this evening than just to say there is an issue and we must do something in a methodical kind of way of doing it. And we have we have the methodologies for doing it. So we don't have to invent anything uh, to do it. We know how to do it. Uh, but it's just uh, it's setting out a kind of a structured way of doing it rather than it being dealt with in a in a in a you know in a kind of uh, based on the last person who shouted. Really. Hi there. My name is Joanne Finnegan. I'm an occupational therapist working in housing. And just a couple of points, um, I'm also an apartment owner, um, and I'm sure people can imagine that there are apartment owners out there who have experienced that there are issues in their apartments, but they're not actually saying because they're afraid of what is to come. Mm -hmm. You know, there might be little issues that have, mm -hmm. but they're afraid mm -hmm. to get inspections. We've, we've, all, we've all come yeah, across so it, that's, yeah? that's a really, yeah. obviously, big thing. Um, I just wanted to ma ask about the working group as well. Was there um, was there conversation around um, responsibility? I know you were talking about loans that people would take out themselves, but and the government. I'm not sure what way they're going to work it. But what about the people who actually built the houses? Well, that that like I mean, repeatedly that seems to be the issue that comes up. The people, the the, the people who built it, the people who kind of I suppose should have been responsible, they're long gone. And but the, are they long gone? Have they some of these not set up again in other but I think the com construction the, companies? The, com the company that that dealt with it is is mm. is long gone. And you, you know, I mean, I think there can be. We could spend forever having recriminations about it. We are where we are, I suppose, with it. Uh, we have an issue. Uh, we have it has to get addressed. Uh, and that, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I suppose maybe if I turned what you said on its head, if we were to say that. Um, Supposing there was a limitless amount of money in the morning, and that the uh, that some some fairy godmother came along and gave out gave out all the money that was needed to do it all, uh, we'd have it done. The the big barrier to this is money uh, to get it done. I mean, it will be disruptive and it will be do. But if there was a limitless supply of money, we'd have it done. And uh, so that really is the barrier. And I suppose the only people who can step in in that regard is is the state in some whatever shape they do whether it's grant whether it's guaranteed loan whether it's you know whatever it is there's has why to be right, some why right, <coughs> increasing sure responses yeah 
Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I suppose one of the downsides, which which I haven't mentioned because I want to get into the Aeon and, and things like that and Valner, but, um, you know, there, one of the things that has been a consequence of defects being identified is the um, is that insurance premia are go up and that uh, with it. So, you know, there's a lot of, it's a morass, really, you know, when it, uh, when it gets going. I just have a, a, a technical query, Michael Lyons. Yeah. Um, my technical query relates to the methodologies of remediation. Mm. And does the current technical guidance provide enough solutions to allow for some apartment buildings or other residential buildings, very, the very invasive fire stopping that's required, for instance, in the external walls, yep. you showed some two very good images of the fire stopping of the cavities in external mm. walls, that, that could the department not stand over, provide uh, a further technical guidance in relation to remediation of buildings built during the boom or even the buildings that were built prior to the building regulations, already existing buildings that where you find similar absences, say something from the 1960s or mm. 70s that didn't have fire stopping in cavities. Mm. And is there room for that as well to, to assist in this remediation? Well, like it's extraordinarily difficult to um, to fit uh, cavity barriers along along the uh, along the horizontal or vertical lines of the co of the compartmentation. It's uh, just very very difficult, and we don't need to uh, uh, go uh, much beyond that. Um, and I agree with you that you know there are there are other ways which kind of uh, would require kind of professional judgment in relation to providing uh, not the same. Kind of level of protect of what was envisaged within technical guidance <laughs> document, but say something you know pretty similar, uh, which Both which would be the, but that could be one, or it could be to just leave it then to take the take the windows out, seal the reveals, uh, and you know seal all the all the um, the vents and that that are going through going through the wall, you know, and uh, but I, I I think to be fair that uh, if the uh, if what I'm saying was kind of picked up and people, you know, that there was a, a, a fire risk assessment um, national kind of protocol uh, set up with it, uh, I think there would have to be some kind of guidance as well, you know, for assessors and that to enable them to be able to make kind of, you know, good judgments and that we can end up with something that's equivalent to uh, what was required within the within technical guidance document. But the idea of kind of I think in the diagram there that uh, that I showed in relation to um, in relation to cavity barriers, the installation of kind of cavity barriers along the horizontal and vertical compartment lines, it would be extraordinarily difficult to, to do. Thank you very much, Eamon, on behalf of the, the vision. Very interesting thank and um, thank you very much. Thank you.